Yeah. 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 So who would, oh, now, okay, so, yeah, let's go ahead and turn you on. Um, yeah, who's the controller? So, we're, we're actually behind there. So, and who's going to um, give me the signal? Uh, yeah. Well, there's no, you're giving the signal. And, and I have the full, we have the whole hour. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you this. Um, it should be a little bit. Is it just, uh, just so much? Do you want us to end early? Do we have a full hour? The break starts. Yeah. 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 Oh, Kish. So we had a few minutes early. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know what it's so funny because I was asked actually I was asking you know, um, do you use yeah okay but if if you're taking you'll need it you'll need to you'll need to have some like, uh, online audience okay so somebody would just see we have one but let's see how we go more than what's your Instead of me trying to, yeah, 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 it's just a little more. 
I have uh, I try my like, uh, I usually sit over here. Definitely, there's definitely no kill. <laughs> 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 Jen called me out directly on the stage. Like we like constructive criticism. Right. <laughs> Just a suggestion. What? It was a suggestion. No, my suggestion. No, I've been very, I've been very important. Is that, oh, we're up for live? Welcome back for the continuation of track one at Hack the Capital. Just a reminder, uh, if you remember my opening remarks this morning, I talked about that one of the key things is not just the content, but the relationships. And so a reminder, at, after the uh, final keynote at 4 o'clock, we will be having refreshments of the alcoholic and non-alcoholic variety available to support your networking. So critical infrastructure, cybersecurity, and resilience. Proactive and coordinated efforts are essential to strengthen and maintain a secure and resilient critical infrastructure. This panel will discuss US policy priorities to defend critical infrastructure from cyber threats and how those policy efforts are being implemented across key infra critical infrastructure sectors. Steve Kelly, the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Cyber and Emerging Technology at the White House, serves as a Special Assistant to the President Oh, that part's repetitive. <laughs> Returning to the National Security Council staff after having previously served during the Obama administration. In this role, Mr. Kelly leads national policy making and advises the president and NSC leadership on matters involving cyber defense, critical infrastructure security, resilience, cyber incident management, and relevant emerging technologies. He serves as chair of the US government's cyber response group, vulnerabilities equities process, and the cyber interagency policy committee. Mr. Kelly is a special agent on detail from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, where he most recently served as the Chief of Cyber Policy. Over his two-decade tenure, Mr. Kelly has served in various cyber program roles in both the field and FBI headquarters, including investigations, private sector, and international engagement, strategy, policy, and leadership. Prior to his government service, Mr. Kelly practiced as a registered professional engineer. Thank you for that. I, I need to shorten my bio. <laughs> Apologies for having to suffer through that. Uh, it's a pl pleasure to be here at Hack the Capital with a wonderful panel uh, who I'll introduce. And, and uh, throughout the course of the next hour, uh, you can get to know them better as we talk about critical infrastructure, cybersecurity. Um, but uh, wow, has it been an eventful year or two in cyberspace? Uh, we've seen cyber incidents. Uh, you know, ranging from uh, attacks involving critical infrastructure like Colonial Pipeline and JBS Foods, uh, ransomware attacks infecting hospitals and schools and every manner of, of uh, <clears throat> potential victim. We've seen some interesting interactions in the threat space where, uh, uh, you know, ordinarily uh, you would not see nation state actors going after things like Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, you know, and we're now seeing kind of this interesting um, uh, interaction between state and on-state actors and blurring of lines in those areas. Uh, back in July, uh, a very interesting cyber attack uh, uh, from the Iranians to uh, Albania, affecting uh, civilian government systems there uh, and citizen services. Uh, and so a very significant wiper malware attack that uh, caught a lot of attention by us and, and generated a very significant uh, international response. So 
there's been more than enough work for, for us at the White House and across the agencies that are involved in these types of issues. And it certainly does underscore the need to elevate our cyber defenses, and in particular, involving critical infrastructure, because we're seeing things being affected in ways that they had not before. So um, as a result of that, and as, as, the, uh, as the, the federal government has authored a new cybersecurity strategy, these are the, 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 the context in which we uh, uh, drafted that, and, and credit to the Office of the National Cyber Director for an effective process at uh, creating a strategy, get, getting that across the goal line. And as you noticed in pillar one of that strategy, critical infrastructure, cybersecurity uh, is right up front. Uh, and something that's an interesting flourish is that uh, it's not apologetic about the idea that that critical infrastructure cybersecurity is not a nice to have, it's a must have. And uh, it, it is quite uh, forward leaning in saying that we need to have uh, through regulation, minimum cybersecurity requirements in critical infrastructure. Uh, and so that is a departure from the past, but I think that our experience has shown that the voluntary approach you know, by itself doesn't quite get us to where we need to be in terms of, of, of elevating uh, 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 cybersecurity across, across critical infrastructure and to be implementing the best practices that we've known for probably 10 or 20 years as to what to do, uh, but these things aren't quite getting done. Uh, so that, uh, that is a, a, a significant focal point. Um, our, our approach, uh, uh, the administration's approach has been to take a fairly pragmatic uh, stab at this, which is a, what we call the sector by sector approach, looking at each critical infrastructure sector, what authorities do we have, and what are the ways that we can implement minimum cybersecurity requirements, and, and getting those things in motion. And you've seen evidence of that. We're going to talk about, you know, for sure, one of those sectors where there's a recent uh, uh, development, but you've seen TSA issuing security directives and pipelines and rail and aviation. Uh, we're going to talk about the EPA's water rule coming up here uh, momentarily. And, and so that that is kind of the approach we're taking as opposed to looking for some sort of broad, uh, uh, ambitious <clears throat> approach, which would require uh, legislation instead. What can we do in the here and now to make the situation better? So we've got a great panel of guests, and I'm pleased to be joined by, to my left, uh, Val Cofield, who is the Chief Strategy Officer at CISA. Uh, and then uh, next to her, we have uh, Brian Manzanek, the Deputy Director uh, of the Office of Preparedness uh, within HHS's Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, ASPR. Uh, and then next to him, we have Nushat Thomas, who is the Cybersecurity Branch Chief at EPA. So we'll have special focus on uh, the healthcare and public health sector and on the water sector, we can poke at those a little bit uh, as we explore this topic. And then Val will be able to bring a broader overarching uh, perspective. So what I'll ask each of our uh, panelists, uh, as I begin the conversation and start to pitch questions um, on the first occasion of them speaking to maybe give you a little bit more about them and their, their uh, bio, uh, maybe perhaps how they ended up in this role that might be instructive to folks that are interested in finding a way into uh, cyber policy and cyber leadership uh, within the federal government. Uh, as you heard from my bio, uh, we all have interesting paths to how we get to where we've, we've been, uh, you know, from, from an engineer to an FBI agent to a policy guy uh, at the White House. I, it could not possibly be replicated. So I, I, it's, it would be hard, be hard to explain how to do that because it's been a strange path, but, uh, but lots of adventures. So let me just start there. Um, with the public, with the healthcare public health sector, and Brian, I'll turn to you. We've seen multiple disruptive ransomware attacks affecting hospitals. Uh, the Common Spirit attack uh, not too long ago was one that caught our attention. The National Health Service in the UK uh, had a major issue, but but it's not them alone. Hospital Tallahassee, Florida, small institutions, big institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and many of these these incidents affect systems. That would, have, that would appear to cause major operational problems for these institutions with canceled surgeries, patient diversions. Uh, and I can't help being concerned uh, with, with the actual delivery of medical care issues that that presents. You know, what do you make of this trend? And fundamentally, are hospitals just so complex that they're undefendable? So I'm curious as to your perspective on just what's happening in your sector. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And, and thanks everyone, great to be here this afternoon. Um, that's a provocative question, so I'll jump in in a second, but to your request, kind of a little 
background on me and, and also just to orient you to the healthcare public health sector, SRMA, role within the Department of Health and Human Services. So, um, I, and I should also note, I've been in my role for a little less than four months. So any hard questions from Steve, I may be- So you haven't solved the problem yet? Haven't <laughs> solved the problem yet. Um, a lot of other great folks uh, have been working at it much, much longer at, at HHS, but um, that'll be my defense if I can't answer any of your questions, Steve. But um, I, I've, as I mentioned, I've been at the department just for a little while within ASPR, which is recently elevated um, to be in the administration of strategic preparedness and response and leave the immediate office of the secretary within HHS. So we're elevating ASPR's mission in large part because it has a, a preparedness and response role that relates to pandemics. And we obviously all just lived through um, uh, the last three years and, and that sort of drove that elevation. But hopefully that'll also create some opportunities for our role in cybersecurity in the healthcare public health sector because ASPR is also, in addition to that pandemic preparedness and response responsibility, is the uh, designee by the secretary for the sector risk management agency role. So we are the lead within the department uh, for that function. Um, there are many, many other parts of HHS that are indispensable partners as we execute that role, but we're sort of the quarterback or belly button within the department. Um, but as I mentioned, I've been there ju just under four months, um, actually came from the legislative branch. I spent uh, just under the last 14 years with the US government accountability office, most recently as a director there leading um, a series of audits focused on emerging threats and capabilities to include some cyber um, related issues and bio. So a nice nexus there. Um, but to your question, Steve, in terms of is it impossible to defend hospital networks? I think uh, the short answer is no, it's not impossible, but it's exceedingly difficult for a number of reasons. I, I'm sure um, and Val, you probably could jump in on this. All 16 sectors probably think are unique and they are unique and pose unique challenges, but the healthcare public health sector in particular, I think is really challenging because um, it's not just the care provider, the hospital, it's a, the whole entire supply chain, all the it's system of systems that ultimately provides patient care and, and, and focuses on that. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities and to attack uh, both the, the, the different systems involved in the supply chain, the interconnected infrastructures with the electronic medical records. Um, it's a historically underfunded, and again, I know this is not unique to the healthcare sector, but certainly a historically underfunded uh, sector in the system that has really been stressed over the last three years in particular. So there's a lot of burnout, staffing challenges, not a lot of extra resources to go around, particularly for cybersecurity. And then you also have all these vulnerable legacy medical devices and equipment um, that aren't necessarily being updated. And we have some activity obviously in that space led by um, my colleagues with the Food and Drug Administration that I can talk about if, if interested. So really, really a difficult sector to protect. Um, also really diverse from the perspective of really large hospital systems to very small uh, single provider uh, rural hospitals. So just a really diverse sector. Um, and then human factors are at play too that make it hard to defend, which again is not unique to healthcare. It's a, a common challenge in terms of cybersecurity, but you've got doctors and others. And I was mentioning earlier, um, as we were talking before the panel started, I, I'm sure many of you have had the experience being in a doctor's office where you'll see a medical device that has a sticky note with the password on it because so many providers are cycling through or for the different physicians to, to be able to log in. So lots of issues there. But um, so it's, I, it's really challenging. I'm not sure it's impossible, but uh, it really argues for us elevating our game within um, ASPR and HHS, which I know we'll get into in a little bit. Um, I did want to also note, um, and I could throw out a bunch of the data in terms of uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association and others talking about the growth of the threat the, in both in severity and, and volume in the sector, but I, I, I'll spare you that for now, but I did want to highlight an article that actually came out from uh, JAMA Network publication this week that's really interesting that focused on not just are the impacts to patient health um, in the affected entities where that's directly attacked, but there was a study that, again, JAMA reported on this week that looked at what they kind of called the blast effects to the other surrounding proximate hospitals that were seeing diversion of patients, um, were seeing their own uh, care provision uh, deferred or delayed with elective procedures. They looked at some data with stroke uh, incidences and how that was cared for. And it really, it looked a lot like what you see with a hurricane or a uh, an earthquake or another major event that actually stresses the whole 
regional system and not just the immediately directly affected area. So that was really interesting. And I think, again, reinforces the need to deal with this near impossible challenge. So let me just react and then and there, there's more that I'd like you to go into. But th that's fascinating because those are the kinds of things that that we would imagine have to be uh, happening, that, that you, you cannot take uh, systems like that down uh, and, and, and the loss of efficiency uh, and, and that that's not going to create uh, problems that eventually are going to be measurable in, um, uh, you know, in poor outcomes. Um, the one thing that I've thought about uh, is, and you can react to this, is that we deploy and implement technology and automation uh, in, in a range of human activities in order to get efficiency. And so in the case of a hospital, you know, we're putting in telemetry or we're uh, able to, 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 to process x-rays much more quickly and get them, you know, to the doctor. Uh, we're writing of prescriptions, managing of the health records. We do all of these things to be able to reduce the number of people that it takes to deliver the care. But then something bad happens and these systems are not available. You know, in order to make up for that, where are you going to find the doctors and nurses to go instead of a one to 12 ratio? It's a one to three ratio to make sure that the, right. the children on the monitors uh, are, are being um, uh, paid attention to. So that's where the problem comes in. I think it's my personal opinion. It's not good enough to say we've got good manual backup procedures. So everything's fine. There's nothing to see here. I think there is something to see here. And that article is, is fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I know, Brian, that your department is, is working with uh, hospitals and the sector doing pilot projects and trying to figure out what right looks like. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a number of things underway that I think we're trying as we as we look to like level up um, in our uh, addressing this threat that we just talked about. One of what you just uh, alluded to, Steve, is our recently completed, at least for the initial phase, um, hospital resiliency landscape analysis, where we did some uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis digging into a, a, a Set, a subset of hospitals to really understand how they were implementing some of the voluntary best practices that we put out, which I'll pivot back and talk about those in a second. But um, I think that continues to be and, and should be a real priority for us, understanding the environment so we can target our efforts, understand where there are gaps. Um, that's something that is hard to do in this sector um, for a number of reasons, um, but we're really making great strides. So that was a first step in, in that direction. But stepping back, kind of the things we do now as the SRMA, um, and, and we coordinate this with partners within HHS and then with CISA and other key interagency partners as well. So, so acronym police, so sector risk management agency. Yes, sector risk management agency. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we, I think fundamentally we do a couple things. We develop resources that are sector specific to help the sector bolster its cyber posture. For the healthcare public health sector, we've been pretty active in this space recently. Um, I just mentioned uh, some of the guidance that we put out that we used in that landscape analysis to see how they were doing, but the, the actual um, voluntary best practice we put out, we really have two sets that we, or two documents that are pivotal here, both of which came out in updated forms just in the last couple of months. The first is a healthcare public health cybersecurity framework implementation plan, which is essentially taking the, the NIST framework and, and tailoring it and mapping it and helping explain its relevance and how to apply it in the healthcare public health setting. So. That's one key document we put out. Another one that really complements it, and I think gets a little more granular in how to implement that cybersecurity framework is something we call, and I'll define the acronym, but we call it the HICCUP. It's the Health Industry Cybersecurity um, Practices Guide. It's uh, the HICCUP, which we put out before, we just put out a new version, really you know, much more granular level with sort of off the shelf, usable resources, awareness, uh, posters and documents, checklists, is available to the sector. So those are two key resources we develop. We also, um, working with our interagency partners, with the FBI and with CISA, do monitor the threat environment. And, and to the extent we can, we share threat uh, intelligence or amplify some of the guidance that CISA and others are pushing out that are relevant to the sector. So those are sort of the resources we develop. The second main line of effort, that, again, that we're trying to amplify to rise to this threat is really just facilitating sector coordination and dialogue on this issue. Um, that is a lot more time intensive than you might think and, and resource intensive, both internally within HHS, really big department, a lot of key players with um, FDA, with we have something called the, the 405D program within our office of the chief information officer is 
um, which is critical, puts out a lot of great information and, and, and many other entities. I think there's roughly 12 uh, divisions within HHS, major divisions that we coordinate as the SRMA on a weekly basis with a cyber uh, working group. And then we have a lot of external coordination with the sector as well through the Health Sector Coordinating Council, through the SRMA kind of structure with the Sector Coordinating Council, which is not just cyber, it's all hazards, and the Government Coordinating Council. So a lot of coordination where we push those resources I just mentioned um, and other things and get feedback and try to tailor our activities to support them, to understand the sector's needs. Um, and then the last piece that I think is critical that we're trying to amplify and probably, frankly, where we have the most room to grow is in response planning and supporting incident response. So HHS just signed out. This is an internal document, but we have now a updated cyber incident response plan that was recently signed um, that we're now planning to, to really implement, flesh out our, our capability to, to exercise that plan. We work with CISA to host a number of tabletop exercises with the sector as well to think through how they respond to, to incidents. So that's that incident response planning is a key activity. The actual incident response, too, is something that we're focusing on. We track the, uh, the cyber incidents. We're really tracking roughly half a dozen or so significant incidents in the sector on a, a, each week. And that obviously ebbs and flows. Um, but uh, our focus at ASPR is really on understanding the impacts on patient health and safety, what are the implications for the sector, what, what should we do? Uh, FBI and CISA, I think, more often have, have a direct role with the affected entity. We're engaging with the broader uh, region, the public health system in, in that region. And that's an area where uh, you know, we're tracking it. Our, our incident tracking is, is pretty good, working with our interagency partners. But I think there's real room to grow to think about what is incident response? What can we offer to help mitigate major attacks against the healthcare public health sector. So that's another area where I think we need to elevate our game where we're focusing a lot. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, so if you get, get a quick answer on this, I'm sure folks are wondering, you know, what's coming after after the, uh, you know, the hospital pilot, the mapping, the landscape analysis, the recommendations, you know, is this moving towards, you know, increased regulation and requirements on hospitals or is that thought leadership is expected just to kind of permeate in a voluntary way or maybe informs uh, hospital accreditation. How does that work? Yeah. Uh, maybe 30 seconds on where yeah, you're going yeah. there. So um, we're definitely exploring that and the landscape analysis is informing it, obviously under the um, overarching guidance from the national cyber strategy moving in that direction. So we're thinking through that. We do have in the sector some incentives that I think help with the voluntary guidance that I just mentioned. For example, the HIPAA security rule essentially will, uh, for a covered entity, if they have a security uh, information breach, a cyber breach, and they can show that they implemented the hiccup, for example, over the preceding 12 months, it can mitigate the penalties that they're subject to. So we do have some regulatory incentives, but we're exploring more things along the lines of mandatory standards. Okay, great. Well, let's, um, let's pivot to the, the water and wastewater sector. Uh, and that's certainly not immune to incidents. Uh, you know, we've been tracking, uh, it, it seems like the one that rings the most in my memory is the Oldsmar, Florida incident uh, that involves some you know, manipulation of, uh, of systems and some chlorine levels and that sort of thing. But there have been others. Israel had some issues. I was looking through some news clips and, and we've, there's been a number of water sector issues. And, and that is a great example of a sector that uh, you would not ordinarily find in many of the, uh, of the owners and operators, especially as I think there's thousands of them, Mushat, you can clarify for us. Uh, some of these are very small rural cooperatives. They don't have cybersecurity people, uh, and so the idea of of having to, you know, plan for uh, cyber threats uh, is for some of them kind of a novel idea, um, and and ransomware has been certainly hitting a few of those as well. So, um, Nushat, how would you characterize the cyber threat to the water sector and and the plausibility of an attack, you know, leading to a significant problem uh, that affects you know public health and safety? Yeah, well, first let me just level set. Um, I am from the Water Infrastructure and Cybersecurity Resilience Division. That's within the Office of Water. And so the Office of Water within the Environmental Protection Agency performs the sector risk management agency responsibilities for the water and wastewater system sector. And so we've been doing that for a long, since the Bioterrorism Act of 2002, we initially started as a task force on all hazards focus, 
again, developing sector-specific resources to ensure that drinking water and wastewater utilities are prepared to respond and recover to all hazards. I've been there since 2009, so I've been working with water and wastewater utilities on mutual aid projects, community-based water resiliency, making sure we understand the interdependencies between the water utilities and those they serve and those that they rely on. And then most recently, prior to coming into this role, implementing our responsibilities that we had under America's Water Infrastructure Act, where utilities had to conduct a risk and resilience assessment and submit that to us. So to respond to your question, it is very plausible um, that, that an attack could happen at a water system and actually have significant consequences. So it, there's a case where you could have operational technology that's impacted that could also cause changes in chemical levels that will exceed the maximum contaminant levels and then potentially cause public health consequences. And so that's very plausible across small, medium, and large systems um, across the nation. And so I would characterize the cyber threat in the water sector similar to the other sectors. It's a growing threat. Um, it, it's changing every day, and it's something that we need to be prepared to respond and recover to. Okay, great. Uh, so the group is probably aware, and I, I previewed it at the top, uh, of your agency's recent interpretive rule requiring cybersecurity be uh, considered in the drinking water utilities periodic uh, sanitary surveys, name of the program. Um, so what does this mean exactly? And how does the, what does the rule require? And how is that going to work? Because this is all quite new. There's probably some owners operators out there that are trying to figure out how this changes their lives. Yes. So this memorandum, it's an interpretive rule. And so basically what it does is it ensures that the states who have been conducting sanitary surveys on an every three year or every five year basis already. So that's an existing program under the Safe Drinking Water Act where they go in and they evaluate the operation, the management and several other components at a water system to ensure that they're able to provide safe drinking water. So now we're saying that all along when a system actually had operational technology, that sanitary survey should have always included an evaluation of operational technology, especially because that operational technology is being utilized to produce safe water. So it should have been evaluated. And so what this means for those water, public water systems that this is going to impact, it just means that when they receive their sanitary survey every three to five years, the sanitary surveyor will now conduct some form of an assessment, but there's three options for the states. And so one of the things that I do want to highlight is that our sector is very diverse, similar to, to the, um, the, the healthcare sector, we're very diverse as well. And so we have small, medium and large facilities, privately owned as well as publicly owned facilities. So there's no one size fits all. Also our states are very different in how they actually implement the Safe Drinking Water Act as well. And so it was important for us to ensure that they had flexible options. And so there's three options that the states could actually use and they can mix and match these options so they don't have to just choose one of them. So the first option is they can allow the system to be able to conduct their own self-assessment of their cyber practices. And then um, what will happen is when the sanitary surveyor comes in, they will review that report. If that set system doesn't have the capability to conduct their own self-assessment, then they can also use a third party assessor, and that would be approved by the state. The state will determine who those third party assessors are. Um, the second option is where they would actually conduct the sanitary survey and also the cyber assessment on site. So the sanitary surveyors feel that they have the training to be able to do that, and we are providing that training to them as well. That's the second option. And then the third and, and option. The second option, we're talking about state regulators that are inspecting water utilities in their states. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. States, they're already conducting those sanitary surveyors. And now when they're conducting it, they're just going to make sure that they review the operational technology as well. And then the third option is an option where we see in a couple of states where they might have stood up homeland security offices who conduct cybersecurity assessments of all critical infrastructure. And so if a state already has that type of a program, we just need to ensure that that program assesses the utilities at least every three or every five years, depending on the required um, frequency for the sanitary survey. They need to ensure that there's a some assessment. And then also most importantly, that if that any identified significant deficiencies actually are 
present and found when they're conducting their sanitary survey, then they may need to make sure that they're closing those cybersecurity gaps, which is what was missing prior um, to this new inter interpretive memo. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure that the questions you're getting from the industry and from the states is that we don't have people with the expertise to do what you're describing. Um, and of course, you've offered a number of options on how you might do that. Uh, I think that, uh, and, and actually, remind me how many water utilities we have in, in the United States. I thought it was like 4,000 or something like that. No, no, there's over 150,000 public water systems, and public water systems are broken down into three categories. There's community water systems, so think your Fairfax water. And then you have your transient non-community water systems, so think of like your local campsite that provide where you drive in and you're receiving water, but it's transient. And then think of your non-transient, non-community water systems. I always say, think of your schools. So they're serving the same population year round, but those folks don't actually live there, um, but they're coming um, in and out every day. So those there's two, di three different types that fall within the public water systems. So whether or not they're a community water system or a non-transient community water system or a transient community water system, they have to receive their sanitary survey at some frequency every three or five okay. years. So I guess the point I'm getting, holy cow. So <laughs> the number of, of organizations that need cyber expertise is almost immeasurable. Uh, and maybe this is a theme we can get to as we go through. Like, how do we meet? We don't, it's, a, it's a workforce challenge. It's a funding challenge. Uh, you know, is, is that the kind of feedback you're getting from, from the state regulators and the sectors is, we don't have people to do this. We don't have the expertise. How do you expect us to accomplish this? And how do you answer that question? Yeah, so that is the, that's exactly the feedback that we've been receiving from the state primacy agencies. But one of the things that we wanted to ensure that we did is ensure that we provided them resources. So we have training in place for those states who actually want to conduct the cybersecurity assessment themselves. We have developed a checklist for specifically for water systems that we derive from the CPGs. Um, so we we'll be talking about the uh, the cross sector, cross -sector cyber, cyber performance, goals, performance goals, in goals. Just a minute. Yes. And so we've, de we've developed an easy to use, it's 33 questions on the checklist, and we're training the states on how to utilize that checklist if they want to go that option. In addition to that, option number one, the utilities can use the checklist themselves. And we also have a tool where we've taken that checklist and put it into an easy to use tool. And then we also are offering to conduct the evaluation for the water systems ourselves. So we also have a service where a utility can register directly with us and we will conduct their evaluation. Mm -hmm. And okay. I, I would just add, Steve, I think for the healthcare public health sector, similarly workforce challenges, similar solutions to in terms of some of the resources I mentioned, we're trying to make them sort of force multipliers to make it easier to use what workforce does exist to implement these things. Well, there there's certainly sounds like a uh, market opportunity for managed security service providers uh, to be able to meet this need. Um, so let me turn to Val. So th thank you, Nushat. Really appreciate that. Um, so could you briefly touch on CISA's role? So we talked about two specific uh, uh, departments that have a responsibility for a particular sector uh, and how their, their, their offices are delivering on that and using their regulatory authorities to improve uh, the security in their sectors. CISA has a unique role uh, as, as, I believe, the newest of, of, uh, of federal agencies uh, and has a, a kind of a shared service responsibility and is also the sector risk management agency for a handful, I can't remember what the number is, six eight. or seven, eight, eight. Uh, sectors. Um, so can you talk about you know, what your role is in critical infrastructure cybersecurity uh, and also as a shared service providers to uh, those two sectors, but more broadly? Yeah, no, great. Um, it's very nice to be here. I'll start with a little bit of a bio yes. like Steve um, asked us to do. So I've been with CISA for just under two years. I'll be celebrating my two-year anniversary at the end of this month. Um, and prior to that, I was at the FBI for 22 years, um, worked uh, with Steve on a variety of, of topics um, with uh, cyber policy issues, as well as just broader digital technology challenges that the FBI faced. Um, how I got to my position really has to do a lot with the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. And I think some of the issues that I'll touch on are actually results of that commission and the uh, recommendations that ended up becoming legislation that really helped support uh, CISA and, and CISA's mission. 
Um, and so I, I was the FBI's uh, senior representative to the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Um, and I did a year detail there that really was, um, it was groundbreaking in many ways. I think the commission report ended up being so effective um, with more than 25 of the recommendations out of their 75 becoming legislation. Um, but then it also just gave me a broader understanding of the challenges that not only the executive branch has when it comes to cybersecurity, but also the legislative branch. Um, and, you know, I think Steve was at many of these dialogues too, where we had back and forth discussions about um, some of the ways. Endless might, meetings. Yes, endless meetings on, on how we might tackle some of these issues. Um, but long story short, uh, you know, when I saw the, this position open at, um, at CISA, I wanted to throw my name in the hat because I thought it was a, a nice arc of helping write those recommendations um, and then being on the end, um, being at CISA now to help implement some of those recommendations. So, and the reason why I wanted to bring that up is in the FY21 National Defense Authorization Act, um, there was section uh, 9002B that actually talks about sector, actually coined the term sector risk management agencies. I think they were called sector specific agencies mm -hmm. prior to that. Um, and if you don't um, know, the US government, uh, and as has been previously mentioned, has divided our critical infrastructure into 16 sectors. And each one of those sectors has a, uh, a sector risk management agency that should be coordinating the effort to secure um, you know, the risk associated with that particular sector. And CISA has the additional role of being the sector risk management agency for eight, I guess you could say 8.5. Um, we are the sector risk management agency for the election sector, which is a subsector of, of government facilities. But um, we also have the role of being the national coordinator for critical infrastructure for the nation. And so this is where, you know, it's, and some of the, um, the helpful parts of that legislation was not only codifying the name of a sector risk management agency, but actually establishing, establishing six roles and responsibilities that each of the SRMAs um, should be conducting. And right now we're actually undergoing a process within um, the government through the National uh, Security Council. It's an effort between um, the directorate, the cyber director that Steve's in, as well as the, the resilience directorate. Um, and in looking at uh, the Presidential Policy Directive 21 that talks about critical infrastructure. So we're having ongoing dialogues right now about, about these roles and responsibilities and, and CIS's role in, in coordinating this national effort. And so one thing that we did um, as a part of this is uh, we released back in October what we called our cross-sector cyber performance goals. And really we see them as complementary to the NISC cybersecurity framework. It's, it's really um, a more targeted list of about 39 um, act steps that agencies can take and really, or businesses can take. And it's really to help those that are, are less um, sophisticated and mature. And, and we really have um, checklists as well of things that you can, um, you can follow and implement. And we're also trying to tailor those more specifically to sectors. So um, for example, uh, K through 12, the public education sector has unfortunately been the victim of many ransomware attacks and, and continues to be the victim of, of ransomware attacks across the nation. And so we recently re um, released a cybersecurity toolkit for K through 12 administrators. So it really helps them and it provides these, these checklists and these toolkits. If you only have a certain number of resources, um, you know, focus your efforts here. And, and we're really trying to work with what our director calls uh, target rich and resource poor, which includes health and human resources and the water sector, which all of, as they've already mentioned, right, they're very diverse sectors. The level of sophistication across the sector varies uh, tremendously. Um, and, and unfortunately, they are um, a rich target for malicious cyber actors. And so we've been, we've been meeting actually with the agencies and trying to come up with, again, specific work plans on how to help them and using our resources. So CISA also has um, regional assets, and you know these regional assets also are available to help with, with conducting um, assessments. And they're also out there to help um, also promote um, one thing that also came out of um, one of the, some of the recommendations from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission was giving CISA state um, cybersecurity grants. And so each of the states um, has been able to uh, submit a cybersecurity plan to CISA. And you know we're actually in the uh, stages of evaluating, I believe, the first set of 11 or 12 state cybersecurity plans. And once these plans have been approved, um, we're, we're able to provide them funding. So I think it's a, 
billion dollars over the next 10 years, which again is, is only a small investment when you consider how expensive cybersecurity is and, and um, the work that needs to be done there, but it is a step in the right direction of really trying to help these, um, these entities that are not as well resourced and, and really do need the help. So I'll amplify that, um, you know, in addition to important grant programs like, like the state and local cybersecurity grant funds, we're also uh, in the administration trying to make sure that uh, the broad set of infrastructure investments, uh, you know, between the infrastructure investment and jobs act and, and some other uh, major pieces of legislation, there have been massive appropriations, you know, trillion dollars into infrastructure and uh, the requirements on any particular grant program, uh, you know, may or may not allow us to either fund or, or, or add uh, as a requirement for, for those, um, uh, for those grants, cybersecurity elements, but to the extent that there are ability to do that, we are absolutely doing that to make sure that that, that, that money is funding the kinds of things that we're talking about. Uh, and also that if we're building new infrastructure, we need to make sure that it's uh, safe and secure by design. So uh, that's a wonderful point. So uh, in terms of what CISA offers, um, both in terms of uh, you know, assessments and tools and information and, and such, uh, some, there's some direct services, uh, but then also uh, what the SRMAs are, are, are doing and, and, and offering, you know, for the sectors that they have responsibility for, you know, what, what should, for instance, the healthcare sector and the water sector be expecting from CISA versus HHS and EPA? Uh, how does that work? How do you choreograph that uh, so that folks aren't confused as to where they need to be going for help and what those services look like? Well, we're, we're trying to, and, and again, um, we've been fortunate to be on the receiving end of, of some resources to help with this. We have within our, um, within our agency, our stakeholder engagement division that um, has a responsibility of having actually specific people um, designated to coordinate within each of the SRMAs um, that exist. Uh, so we have our own SRMAs duties, as, as we've mentioned before, but then also to make sure that we stay synced up and coordinated um, with the other eight sectors that CISA is not an SRMA over. And again, we are trying to, you know, even though we have been fortunate to receive resources, we still do have a limited amount of resources. And we have some sectors that are much more sophisticated and better resourced when it comes to cybersecurity, like the financial sector, like the energy sector. And so with them, we really partner and we are working um, to uh, to have sector specific cybersecurity performance goals, and so with the financial sector, um, we are working together with them. Um, but they have already taken the lead of starting that process. Um, with other sectors, you know, we think that the cybersecurity performance goals as is are, is probably right at this moment, and then we will iterate um, as we learn more as people start to implement these cybersecurity performance goals. So I think we're we're partnering, um, and we have regular meetings and. Um, with you know the SRMAs, but having a focused areas on those that are that are less resourced and less capable, trying to really bring in our expertise. Because as we've all mentioned, um, you know the cybersecurity talent uh, workforce um, shortage is is a real shortage, and you know even CISA has you know challenges. We actually just had a huge um, recruiting fair yesterday, and we're continuing um, to see our numbers increase, but we still have a gap. Um, and, you know, I know that that's even harder and more compounded when you look at, I don't think a lot of people who are inter who have entered the cybersecurity um, workforce necessarily think about HHS or EPA as places where they should, um, you know, should be utilizing their skills and, and that they're needed. And so this is where we are working together and trying to join forces um, and multiply. Okay. So I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Brian a new shot uh, as what respond as well. And, and maybe I could insert as another idea that you can react to kind of the relevance of the of the cyber performance goals and how those are being you know incorporated into your efforts uh, uh, in your mm -hmm. sector specifically so uh, any, yeah. any reactions yeah to that? well i would i would foot stomp what val just said too in terms of the partnership with CISA from our perspective at hhs and in asper is absolutely critical that i mentioned the weekly cybersecurity working group internal meeting within hhs that we hold um, where we meet with all the different divisions and coordinate on these issues. CISA is, I say it's internal, but CISA actually is a, a weekly attendee of that meeting as just sort of a reflection how closely partnered up we are. And we're doing a dual seal products joint efforts. As, and, and we hope to amplify that going forward too and do more of that. Um, in terms of the 
Um, I'm sorry, the, quite, the second part. Of your there's question. probably more than one question uh, built in. <laughs> uh, also, we were kind of going through, you know, what what should the sector expect of of your agencies uh, and and CISA in terms of, you know, your your roles. What's the service you provide? Because uh, Washington's a long way away. And in terms of when they're when they're experiencing a problem, you know, it's probably not the first thing they're thinking of. Uh, yeah. is, is is you know. What is HHS doing for me, or what can I ask? Right, and and again, I think that illustrates why it's so important that we work closely together. That so whoever they call, pick up the phone and call CISA or HHS, the right people, whoever that may be, and it may be neither of us, it may be somebody else, maybe the FBI, um, who needs to get involved. That we can connect them quickly to who they need to get the support they need. But um, I think you're going to see going forward from HHS and ASPR more of a partnership with CISA. Um, Val, you mentioned the toolkit. That's been developed for other sectors. We're actively working with CISA on a toolkit um, that will be presented from both of us jointly um, along the same lines for the healthcare public health sector. So I think you're going to just see more and more collaboration and partnership and putting out uh, joint and dual seal products as we go forward. And I, I would also note from a regional perspective, HHS and ASPR also has a regional presence. And that's another area where as we work at, especially I would say from an incident response capability where we can maybe partner up better in the regions uh, to engage a sector too. Yeah. Um, Actually, one thing I wanted to add as far as um, tools and services that CISA is, does provide, um, a, a, my wonderful CISA colleague has reminded me um, about our cyber hygiene program, you know, where we are really encouraging um, sectors to sign up for this because, you know, if you're in our systems, then, you know, as we learn about um, new, new threats um, and we run that against, uh, one, run that against our holdings, we can then contact those um, those entities, you know, if they have that vulnerability that hasn't been been patched or updated. And so it's a really important tool that we are really trying to encourage people to sign up and it's free, right? Yeah, we're actually partnering with you guys to develop a fact sheet to roll that out to the water and wastewater system sector as, all, as well, because I know right now that there's low subscription rates across our sector. But we are also, we have leveraged the CPGs in our checklist that we've delivered to the drinking water systems in order for them to be able to conduct their cybersecurity assessments, as well as converted that into that easy to use tool for the primacy agencies are also the drinking water utilities. But also we are continuing to get to work with you guys on other activities. We do tabletop exercises. We make sure that we invite the cybersecurity advisors for that specific area to this to the actual tabletop exercise. We're going to be doing a workshop actually one tonight for Region 9. And we're going to have the CSA participate in that as well. So we try to make sure that we're coordinating with you guys, not just at the, at the federal at, the, at this level, but also across when we're working in our regions as well. So let me, uh, maybe we can close with this and there might be a few extra minutes so we can take a question or two from the audience. Um, another two-part question, and you can react to either or both. Um, you know, what, what's your sense of the appreciation across your sector and your stakeholders uh, to the significance of the cyber threat and the importance of, of, of building plans around it, building capability around it, doing something about it, protecting themselves from it, uh, and then kind of related to that, what's your outlook for how the critical infrastructure owners and operators space, which is diverse from the from the below the cyber poverty line folks all the way up to the major players, you know, how is that demand, how is that need for expertise and for action and for resources to level up? You know, what does the future look like? as to you know, where that comes from, how is that need and demand going to be met? Um, because I think, well, I'll just preview my thought, there's not enough folks to go around. There's going to have to be mm -hmm. uh, some creative ways of, of getting at that. So any, any thoughts on the, on the outlook? I, so, yeah, I can start. I think um, I know um, my, our director, Easter Lee, spoke earlier today here, and I'm sure she talked about um, this initiative that CISA has that's really in line with the national cybersecurity strategy is, so Steve mentioned a paradigm shift in that strategy is really talking about regulation up front and, and its role um, in the nation's, um, in protecting the nation's cybersecurity infrastructure. But I think also um, one, one important concept that's in that cybersecurity strategy, as well as um, a, a big priority for 
uh, Jen Easterly is this idea of secure by design and secure by default. So I think it's still important, the work that we're doing to, to raise awareness and to educate owners and operators and customers, you know, of making sure that they have their patches update. I mean, even the basics, right, are still not being done. Um, making sure that, that um, uh, owners and operators of critical infrastructure use multi-factor authentication. Um, but I, I think with the paradigm shift that we're really trying to make is um, as as technology is being built, as software is being created, cybersecurity really needs to be at the front end of that and not as a bolt-on in the back end, which we know makes the product less cyber secure. And this is something that we are working on, um, you know, together with the National Security Council, the Office of the National Cyber Director. Again, CISA is not a regulator. This is not something that we can mandate, um, but it's really a dialogue that we want to have with the community um, in really making that a part. And you know, and that's right now the market forces are you know first to market is 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 at prime, you know takes primacy. But you know that might be something that we need to reconsider um, as we think about building products that have cybersecurity intentionally built in them. Um, at the beginning as they're thinking about um, the product that they're trying to build. And, and that's what we're hoping to do. And I know our director is really out there because I think it's got to be both, right? Mm -hmm. We've got to start building technology with that um, at the forefront of those, those um, developers, as well as, again, raising the awareness and, and continuing to beat the drum about cybersecurity. And also another thing that's, that our director is really passionate about that I think I think is taking hold but hasn't totally taken hold of is this idea of corporate cybersecurity responsibility. So we, we, we hear about corporate social responsibility, but really um, we think that CEOs of companies need to take cybersecurity very seriously. And it needs to be um, at the board of directors, at the CEO level, understanding the importance of the cybersecurity posture of their businesses. Okay, uh, Brian, yeah, uh, quickly. Yes, sorry. Um, I just, I would, on the secure by design perspective, I think going forward for the healthcare public health sector, I alluded to it earlier, but the FDA got additional authorities in the, the omnibus legislation in uh, December that are going to hopefully help, at least from the medical device perspective. It's not going to deal with those that are grandfathered in, and there's ideas like Senator Warner's proposed, like cash for clunkers for those devices that maybe we'll, we'll get at that problem if that uh, pans out, but, um, but that will hopefully help us get closer to CIS's vision there. But in terms of your question, Steve, about the, the awareness of the threat, unfortunately, because as we talked about at the very beginning of this conversation, the threat is growing and sophistication, complexity, also visibility. I think there is more increasing recognition in the healthcare public health sector of how important this is. And then I would end on a note that within ASPR, um, we are in the process now of standing up a dedicated cyber division within our critical infrastructure protection office that didn't exist before, in large part to actually enable to go out to the C-suite level, engage more robustly with executives in partnership with CISA to continue to raise awareness to the threat and these tools that we offer. Excellent. Uh, Nishant? Yeah, I would just say, um, again, like everyone else said, uh, it's a growing threat. But in addition to that, one of the things that we need, and especially in our sector, is a cultural change. So um, talking about corporate responsibility and making sure that um, not just the leadership is committed to it, but also all, down, all the way down to the operator level. Everyone needs to understand across the organization the importance of cybersecurity, and it needs to be a part of what they do every day, um, especially when they're asking for conveniences, like the ability to remote into a facility. They need to think about, you know, how cyber secure is that and what might it take. We might need to add on multi-factor authentication and that's not something that's going to burden you. <laughs> it's going to make sure that you're more secure. Um, so we definitely need a cultural shift. And so that's one of the things that we've been working on as well, working together with the Water Sector Coordinating Council, making sure that we're increasing the awareness. And you can see that just across all of our conferences. Uh, I know a couple of years ago, you might have saw one or two topics on cybersecurity, if that. But now, a lot of our conferences now have these cybersecurity tracks where they're focusing. Um, I just participated in a conference yesterday where we're kind of highlighting across some, with some of the, the larger facilities, what are they looking at in terms of new innovation? And then how is that new innovation competing with security? Um, because there's not, they're not necessarily always aligned when we um, think about uh, upgrading to the, the, the 
this new thing that might help them with their operation. So a cultural shift is something that we're working on. Um, but in addition to that, just making sure that we're continuing to partner with the sector. Um, there's a lot of utilities out there, but we've been working together for years um, to address other threats, not just this one. I mean, this is just one of the many threats impacting water systems, right? Hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, et cetera. Um, aging so, pipes. <laughs> yeah, aging infrastructure. So again, we've been uh, successful partnering with the sector to ensure that they are addressing these threats. That means they're, first of all, conducting risk assessments so they know what their risks are and then identifying ways to be able to get after it. And we're helping them with identifying resources and providing resources in some cases, but there's also shared resources, um, mutual aid networks that are um, happening across the nation as well. So That's great. Well, I, I, with, with, with the last word, I'll say uh, the increased regulatory environment and certainly the, the need to deal with, with these issues presents a huge business opportunity. So uh, this is something where I think that there's going to need to be innovation in the space and there's lots of customers out there that need help. So uh, it'll be exciting to see what the next few years brings. Uh, thank you to my, my wonderful panel, Nushat, Brian, and Val. And we're, we're out of time, so no questions, but thank you all. Thank you. Let me give you my card. Well, I guess oh, oh, mine's is all there. So let me just fill the mic. Sorry, we're yeah. gonna get to meet in person before yeah, doing this. Absolutely. All right, coming up, we will have a virtual fireside with Kelly Moan, who is the CISA for the city of New York.
All right. And are you, can you check sound? Can you speak? Yes, I can. Hello. All right. Check, check, check. Kelly serves as the Chief Information Security Officer of the City of New York. In this role, Ms. Moan leads the Office of Technology and Innovations Cyber Command to protect, defend, and respond to cyber threats across the city. Prior to her appointment as the City CISO, she served as the CISO for the New York Police Department and a Division Chief for the Department of Homeland Security in Washington, D.C. Throughout her career, she has taken a holistic and mission-driven approach to cybersecurity with a strong focus on collaboration. So just providing a, a couple of more comments on that. Um, the reason that we invited Kelly, who we appreciate that you are able to join us at least virtually, even if we couldn't get the travel room, is because when we talk about critical infrastructure, all too often of it, we think of it at the federal level. Who else looks at critical infrastructure other than the US government? Well, it turns out that those communities that I was talking about in my opening remarks have their own structure at the city and the state level to deal with this. And it's not just the same. Um, and so with that, Kelly, uh, if you would like to uh, start with some comments to bridge from there. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much, Bryson. It's my pleasure to join you for Hack the Capital. Before moving to New York City, I spent the largest part of my career here in DC. So it's great to be back even virtually. I'd also like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me to speak today. This is such a great event and I'm delighted to be surrounded virtually by so many bright minds in the cybersecurity industry. As the financial, cultural, and media capital of the United States, New York City continues to be a prime target for adversarial nation states, cyber criminals, and the like. To protect and defend against our current and future threat landscape, we've adopted a whole of society approach. It's foundational to New York City's security and economic prosperity in the 21st century. We live in a modern world of complex and increasingly costly cyber attacks that include everything from ransomware to extortion to phishing scams perpetrated against individual residents. That is, not, that is the not so new normal. And cybersecurity remains one of the top priorities for New York City for that reason. So let's take a step back and talk a little bit about who we are and what we do at New York City Cyber Command. In January 2022, Mayor Adams signed Executive Order 3, which brought together all of the city's existing tech agencies, including New York City Cyber Command, under the Office of Technology and Innovation, led by Chief Technology Officer Matthew Frazier. A subsequent executive order, Executive Order 10, named Cyber Command's roles and responsibilities, expanding them, including setting information security policy standards, leading citywide cyber defense, investigation and incident response, and serving as the primary liaison between public and private partners for cyber intel sharing, investigation, and response coordination. Given that reality, you may be thinking, what does New York City's attack surface really look like? With a GDP of over 1 trillion, over 8 million residents, 100 plus city agencies, and roughly 350,000 city employees, there's not many other public or private organizations that operate at our, at our size. Out of the 16 defined critical infrastructure sectors, we either directly or indirectly support all 16. To do that, we process on average 90 billion security events per week, which we distill down through automation to be able to rapidly detect and respond to first and third party security incidents. The magnitude of the cybersecurity mission spans from protecting basic infrastructure you'd find in an enterprise to complex and emerging technologies across both IT and OT environments. It's protecting the website you use as a resident to request childcare instance, for instance, the electronic charging station you plug your car into, the water coming out of your tap, the portal you use when flat filing your taxes even. These are just a few examples of the breadth of this mission. And our focus remains to make New York City the most resilient city in the world. In February 2022, we also doubled down on our commitment to cybersecurity by launching the Joint Security Operations Center. Mayor Adams partnered with Governor Hochul to launch the first of its kind Joint Security Operations Center here in our facility in Brooklyn, New York. This is a 24 by 7, 365 cybersecurity hub bringing together the city, the state, and federal cyber defenders to share real time insights and respond accordingly to mitigate potential damage. Partnership in the spirit of resiliency has only continued to be an enduring theme for New York City. We are steadfast in our commitment to public and private partnerships to strengthen our whole of society approach to cyber. We closely collaborate with federal, state, local, and private sector partners. And the private sector engagement is incredibly important to us because as many of you in the room are aware, 89% of critical infrastructure is operated by the private sector. Conducting cybersecurity IT and OT assessments 
and prioritized vulnerability remediation are not an either or proposition. They're part of a modern and holistic strategy to protect our cities, which includes a continuous improvement loop to harden and enhance our defenses. Our efforts to maintain cyber resilience across society must, by necessity, extend beyond the arenas of government and private industry to matters of personal cybersecurity and digital literacy. I'm proud to say that New York City, via NYC Secure, was the first city to offer a free app designed to help users protect their mobile phone from cyber threats. New Yorkers who use NYC Secure can sleep easy knowing that they have better protection against potential cyber attacks. New York City continues to be at the forefront of managing the intersection of innovation and cybersecurity while also investing in critical skills our workforce needs to serve this mission space. When the mayor signed Executive Order 10, he mandated that city agencies have a cyber liaison who is neither their CIO or their CISO to work with Cyber Command to fight threats. In the fall of last year, I'm proud to say we launched the first ever Cyber Academy in an effort to upskill and reskill that workforce. Our first class just recently graduated this spring, which includes the first cohort of cyber liaisons. And again, this is above and beyond the training that's available to our existing cyber defenders across the city. This week, we also convened our second Cyber Academy cohort, who will, over the next several weeks, receive specialized training in incident response, network security, and cyber threat intelligence. Bolstering our cybersecurity workforce and enhancing agency cyber capabilities through hands-on training is critical to increase resiliency in the face of cyber attacks, particularly as New York City leverages emerging technologies that come with tremendous potential benefits, but not without cybersecurity considerations. In our post 9-11 world, New York City remains among the world's top targets. We must contend with all forms of attacks, including cyber attacks, that require a comprehensive, coordinated, and robust response. A good night's sleep can seem like a tall order for cyber defenders. We are, by our very nature, we plan for the worst case scenario. However, I'm hopeful that we will continue to make strides as an industry for the common good, to protect our critical infrastructure, our communities, and our society writ large from the cyber threats of today and tomorrow. Thanks for listening. I'm looking forward to our fireside chat, Bryson. Yep, there we go. All right, got the sound back on. So that was a lot, right? That was that was a yeah. lot in terms of initiatives. That was a lot in terms of the coverage, which again, I think New York City is uh, exemplifies as one of the premier cities in the entire world uh, and certainly ties that mission together. Can you talk about the city versus the state perspective with um, roles and responsibilities, differences in vision, and how those collaborations work? Yeah, I think it's really important to stress the partnership aspect as well, right? So I think we do things a little bit differently in New York because, you know, we work together, um, which you don't often see as collectively and holistically as you'd find in a, a state um, and a municipality. And I think that's because New York City is just quite quite frankly, so large. So we have a, a sizable area of responsibility and we have autonomy in that responsibility. So, um, you know, if something happens, people know who to call and how we're going to respond and vice versa, the, the strengthening the resiliency across just not just our area of responsibility, but the outlying uh, areas and in addition, the region and across the US is bolstering that model of collaboration, right? It's making sure you know who to call and when to call um, and you're not meeting them for the first time on that on that phone call, potentially responding to an incident. So I, I read last year that New York State passed, I want to say it was of $64 million explicitly for critical infrastructure funding. And it was notable because it was the first time that I'd seen a state explicitly appropriate money for that purpose. Can you share more detail? So I think the idea of critical infrastructure funding specific to our you know, area of responsibility is really important. Um, like I mentioned in, in my remarks, we in New York City, we, we think about critical infrastructure as you know, the emergency services sector, right, 911. We think about it as, yes, the OT environments, such as distributing water. Um, and to bolster those environments, we need to make sure that there's appropriate funding for those initiatives and we're prioritizing accordingly. So again, I think it's, it's, it's another aspect where we are on the emerging end in the municipality space. Um, and again, writ large in the SLTT space, because we have, a, we have an idea of what our critical infrastructure actually looks like. Right. And I think that's the, the biggest start. And then allocating the funding accordingly is really incredibly important. As one of the 
leading cities in the country. How do other SLTT organizations reach out or collaborate with you? Great question. Um, so we get it through basically every means that you can imagine, right? So we get it through individual outreach, um, through obviously the mayor's office, um, through other partners, sometimes even through uh, our vendor community, right? So when we think about public-private partnerships, we're all trying to solve hard problems and, and challenges. And while New York City, we, we operate largely like a managed security service provider at, at size and scale, our challenges and our opportunities look a little bit differently than a normal municipality or state or, or local government. But what we can provide is those best practices on how to get there and what to start with to start growing your cyber programs and maturity accordingly. And so when we, when we get outreach from neighboring entities or across the US or even internationally, we are, you know, the sort of sharing best practices and then also thinking about, especially across the US, because we see a lot, how are we feeding that back into the ecosystem so that the smaller entities uh, can be protected because of something we may have seen on a larger scale as an active campaign against New York City. And that's really, I think, the value add when we talk about partnerships here. Partnerships are great on paper. Um, having those human relationships, having the ability to share valuable curated insights on um, observables, indicators of compromise and, and hunt packages. Those are the things that really move the needle and help um, the ecosystem. And so that's what we're really focusing on here in New York City. Conversely, on the other side of the spectrum, the U.S. government and all of its various SRMAs, um, how does that relationship look? And kind of, I'm gonna, I'm, you know I'm going to do the magic wand question at the end, but I'm going to explicitly tie it also to here. What do you wish U.S. government would do differently as well? So the partnership with the federal government is important, again, because we see a lot. We need to make sure that when we see something, we're able to share it with the widest descent possible, right? And so that means leveraging partnerships, not on, not just on the the federal civilian space or you know Department of Defense, but also law enforcement, making sure that we're kind of bolstering and protecting the the U.S. writ large. Um, I think in terms of the the U.S. government. Um, I was really impressed to see the national cybersecurity strategy that came out most recently. It's, in, it's incredibly hard to find a sort of the sweet spot of an overarching strategy that is that, that sort of meets everyone's need at such a complex operating environment that the U.S. has, right, with, with the public, also all the way to the large enterprises. I think it's a step in the right direction um, in, in walking sort of crosswalking regulatory overlays um, and making it simpler for entities to understand what they're required to report and how they are required to report, again, for the common good, which is ultimately what, what we need to help protect one another. Yeah, I agree. I, it's, it's an impressive document, um, one, in that it is taking us so long to get there, and then two is for a first stab, it is comprehensive and actionable. Um, I think all too often we see government strategy documents that come out and we're like, well, they must have been coming from another planet. Um, so uh, following on that, we know that the Office of the National Cybersecurity Director is also working on a workforce development strategy. I don't know if that's something you've had the opportunity to see or if you have your own opinions on the New York City view of workforce development and strategy. So this is a topic I'm pretty passionate about because I think there's a lot of people that are trying to do good in this space and want to do good in this space and are, right? I think there's no shortage of um, opportunities out there to bring folks into the industry and then also to kind of reskill and upskill. I think in New York City, the approach that we took was we, we saw a need and we wanted to very urgently fill it. And so our launch of Cyber Academy really was uh, focused energy in that regard, right? Let's not just talk about it, let's put something into action and do it very quickly. Uh, and the umbrella program of Cyber Academy is really more than just incident response training for cyber liaisons, but it's the idea of you can, if, if you if you want to get into this field and you have a, a curiosity and, and a talent to learn, um, there's, a, there's a pathway here for you. And I think, you know, sh sharing the insights of what we've built 
and how it's benefited and how we've kind of started to tweak the program over time and will continue to tweak the program. That's information we're passing back into the wider community, making sure that the federal government sees that and understands what we're doing in New York City and what how that's benefited us and how the federal government can help bolster those individual programs. Um, but again, we, we took a really practical approach um, because we saw a need and we wanted to fill it and pace in the sense of urgency around that was the thing that mattered for us. So I'm excited to hear and to see more workforce development programs that really try to operationalize how to get into this field and demystifying the roles you could have in a cybersecurity profession, right? I talk about this a lot. You don't, you're, not everyone in cybersecurity is a penetration tester, right? There's all slews of professions and roles that are incredibly valuable in this field that you could get into. And I remember the last time I was up there on site, you had just come from a TV interview with the local news. And the reason I call that out is it was the uh, graduating class from Cyber Academy. And that it's interesting that that was a local news story because there was that interest in that. Yes, and I think that's the exciting part in New York City. I, I think SLTT writ large, you know, we're on the forefront, right? The public, we are the public, right? We are residents of the community. And so when we have an opportunity to showcase how we think about cybersecurity for New York City and what we're doing to invest in our workforce to better protect the public's data, right, residents, and, and the news wants to talk about it, again, we're having conversations about cybersecurity at the dinner table now, right? The, the community has an elevated awareness about the word cybersecurity, and that again, is helpful to bolster just general cyber hygiene um, across these communities and our, our residents. So it was really exciting to see um, how, how much buzz there was about the graduation. And I know the graduates were incredibly proud um, to be graduating that day. So I'm going to paraphrase something you said earlier into the way I always phrase it is what we all have in common in our community in cybersecurity is the existential dread. Whatever we've done, is it enough? We don't know. Because the final vote that counts is that threat that always, again, with the fish tank story I talked about earlier, the imagination of what they can do and the access and impact for it. And so the humanity of your position as a CISO is that all CISOs share the same level of dread of being the face for that pyramid of we don't really know. And so what keeps you up at night, Kelly? You know I hate that question. I think every CISO hates that question. I there's your existential you know, I, dread in the question. <laughs> my existential dread in the question. So I think I I think all of us, if 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 I care, right? I care so I I sometimes don't don't sleep well at night because I care. Um, I'm really incredibly proud of the team that we have here in New York City, which allows me to sleep at night, um, which is exciting. Um, but I think in general, you know, we have so much great guidance out there, products, we have so many great entities, whether you're talking about federal, whether you're talking about private sector, really across the board, they're trying to do good for communities writ large. Um, I think for me, I think about how can I operationalize what is out there more broadly, right? How can I get the word out there about what entities, organizations, the individual needs to do to protect themselves more broadly? And always, how can I do more, right? How can we as a team do more for the good of the people? And I think if you're not asking yourself that question, um, you know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find any CISO that doesn't ask themselves that question, right? We always are, you know, the ones that are preparing for worst case scenario and, and trying to make sure we're in the most resilient we can be for that scenario. Um, and so, you know, I think, again, New York City is unique because our attack surface is just so broad, right? We do things at scale, which means we have to be a little bit more creative about how we tackle those problems at scale. So it's an exciting place to work uh, and it's an exciting place to be in cybersecurity because I would argue you would not as an individual dropping into a cybersecurity role, you often don't get a chance to impact 
change so deeply on such a large scale with so many different types of technologies at your fingertips. Um, so that's why I think like it, it's super exciting to work in New York City and it's really exciting to support this mission um, and have a, a great team that continues to show up every single day to, to bolster that mission. Okay, the final two questions. This is the, we go into the thinking round. Okay. The first is you are given a non-internet connected, truly air-gapped magic wand. It's a magic wand, which means you get to do one thing to instantly change the entire world to the benefit of New York City critical infrastructure. What would that be? So I'm going to caveat this. I think everyone, when asked this question, would probably say fish resistant MFA. But I'm not going to say that because we're just going to assume that that's already in play, right? We're, that's low-hanging low fruit, but we're going to say that's in play. I would actually say, and I, I really like the guidance that was most recently pushed out, I would say let's take secure by design and secure by default one step further. If you're going to sell a product, right, IT suppliers sell a product to a customer, let's arm that customer with a couple playbooks of how to actually operationalize and demystify real zero trust. No tool is a zero trust tool. How it's used can align to a zero trust strategy. And so when I think about, you know, when building infrastructure more securely, design by default, secure by design, secure by default, and let's pull that thread just a, even more so and have our vendor community arm their customers and ultimately our constituents with operational guidance, real use cases aligned to zero trust, right? Let's talk about conditional access. Let's, let's demystify some of these very basic concepts um, which will get us all stronger together. So I think that would be my, my magic wand. Again, assuming MFA, fish resistant MFA is off the table. I, I know Jen Easterly would be happy if MFA uh, and fish resistance was off the table. And certainly both her and Eric Goldstein would be happy that Secure by Design actually gets implemented at the level that you're talking about. So I think you tied their, to their wish list as well with your magic wand. <laughs> okay, so the final question, five-year crystal ball now. You've waved the magic wand, you're looking at your crystal ball. One good thing and one bad thing that you think is going to happen in the next five years. Okay, so I'll start with bad and end with good. I think the, the bad thing, but I think everyone probably in that room would agree, we're going to see more breaches, right? There's more regulation coming out, more will be reported, it will be talked about more, it'll be more common. But I do think, again, to the extent possible, talking about cybersecurity elevates a conversation, you know, gets folks thinking about as the individual how to more greatly secure themselves, perform cyber hygiene. Um, I think on the, on, the, on the flip side, on the good end, I think if 10 years ago, public-private partnerships and information sharing looked a lot different than it did today, right? I think five, 10 years from now, it's going to exponentially improve even more so than it is now. Again, for the common good, because we are better together. I think in New York City, we've even taken that a step further. Um, we've we've partnered very closely with like-minded um, sort of sister teams, um, partner teams, such as the Office of Information Privacy. I think the the overlay or sort of the Venn diagram between security and privacy is a very unique one. And so we've taken a novel approach in New York City to not just talk about public-private partnerships, but also take it a step deeper and make sure that we're looping in our privacy community into ongoing investigations earlier, right? Because that cross-training and that contextualization really bolsters the entire ecosystem of cybersecurity res response and even some of the, uh, the proactive efforts. So I would say that those would be my, my bad and, and my good thing. At the end of the day, I am hopeful because we've grown so much as an industry over the last five, 10 years. Um, and I think that's only going to increase uh, over the next five. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having having me. I really appreciate it. Are, are you up for doing my first hybrid selfie? Oh yeah. I'm, I'm, you just you just tell me when to smile. I'm trying to figure. Out, your head is very large in this picture. Oh gosh. <laughs> <Smile>. <laughs> Never done that before. Thank you. There you go. It's a first. <laughs> I don't know where to wave to you. 
Oh, she's off. That's always my biggest fear when I'm on one of these virtually is that I'm going to freeze. And there was, I don't know if you noticed that there was a brief moment during her where it was like it was a split second where her eyes were closed and it, it froze for like, like two frames. So uh, that's the first time we've ever done that. that was a, that's, a, that's a unique one. Um, so we have the end of our track one coming up here uh, with David Kleidermacher, who hopefully will be joining us shortly. We're hunting him down. So we can turn this into a free form. Any, up? Oh, oh, he's virtual. I didn't know he was going to be virtual. Hello. Hello. So David Kleidemacher is the VP of engineering for Android and made by Google security and privacy at Google. And they did not pay me for this, but this is the Google Pixel 6. I'm a huge Google Pixel guy. I've been on Android for years. Um, in this role, he leads, I really, you didn't know I was going to do that even, so you're just kind of like, oh, like, thanks. I really, he didn't know that. Um, in this role, he leads the engineering teams responsible for protecting the billions of users and devices in the Android ecosystem and in the made by Google ecosystem. This includes the Google Play App Store, the Android operating system, Pixel devices, Nest devices, Fitbit wearables, and related services. Prior to his role at Google, Dave held positions as Senior Vice President, Chief Security Officer at BlackBerry, and the Vice President Chief Technology Officer at Green Hills Software. Uh, also worth noting, uh, Google is one of the main sponsors of this event, so we truly appreciate your support. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, great to see you all. Um, today's, there's a lot going on today. There's uh, Google I.O.'s annual conference, and um, so I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but uh, I'm happy to join you briefly to share some thoughts on the impact of open systems, especially relative to closed systems on cybersecurity. Uh, I've been a software engineer for over 30 years now and uh, almost all that time in product security and privacy. And I've worked uh, as much or even more on closed systems than on open systems, so I hope I can share some helpful perspective on that. Now, over the years, there's been some debate about whether open or closed systems are better uh, for security. The closed camp theorizes that closed systems enhance security through some level of maybe obscurity, so harder for attackers to know how, how to attack. Um, and vertical integration that has maybe less dependence on suppliers or other third parties. Uh, the open camp, on the other hand, theorizes that open systems enhance security by essentially crowdsourcing research and collaboration across a broad range of, of uh, like-minded organizations. So I'm happy to report that uh, the open approach has by and large proven superior over the test of time. Uh, I'll pro provide some examples around four pillars of open versus closed. So talk about open source versus closed source software, open platforms versus walled gardens, open standards versus proprietary methods, and uh, open information sharing and transparency versus secrecy. So first, open source. Uh, we now see that the Android open source operating system commands higher prices for fully scalable exploits than competing mobile operating systems. And this demonstrates that for products with similar complexity and maturity, that the, the sort of many eyes strategy that you've all heard about is, is more effective over time. But it wasn't always clear that open source would be better. Uh, in the early days, Android had a, a lot of shallow bugs, and it was a fertile ground for vulnerability research. And for closed mobile operating systems, the bugs were there, but closed source meant that they weren't quite as shallow. Uh, there's a There was a sort of a bellwether moment for me in 2016, the time I was uh, at BlackBerry, and uh, there was the, the uh, Pegasus attacks, and I was called into uh, one of the top three largest global banks by their uh, CIO and their CISO to talk about um, the impact of Pegasus on BlackBerry's software, which was it was a security product that ran at the application level. And you know, as as I, I'm sure all of you remember, the, the Pegasus had multiple zero-day vulnerabilities that enabled a zero-click full compromise of the iPhone. And and the folks there wanted to understand like what is the impact on this application security, which I, I was really surprised that they didn't understand that it would compromise everything, not just uh, including the applications. But 
also, it was pretty shocking to me that um, they asked the following question. They said, well, th this is kind of the first really big hack that we've seen. And we're, we're like, we're, we're really dependent on these phones for security. And do you think there'll be more of these exploits going forward? And I was like, you know, um, there are many millions of lines of code that impact security on the operating system. And at a bug for every thousand lines of code, uh, the existence of exploitable vulnerabilities is guaranteed. And so they were sad. Uh, of course, you've all seen in the past seven years or so, like a steady stream of such exploits. But now you might ask, how do we know that these exploit pricing and exploit costs are high or as high or higher than in closed platforms? Well, we get data from a variety of sources, including elite hacking teams, exploit brokers, hacking contests, and uh, other dark web sources. And I believe the reason for this shift over time is really simply due to resourcing. So a closed product has the resources of the company that develops it. But Android has the massive investments in security, not just from Google, but from the Linux open source community, the security teams from many device manufacturers like Samsung, and from the security teams from component suppliers like Qualcomm and others. So you can read more on this topic. Uh, I wrote a blog about it. It's called Open Versus Closed Source, Which Wins for Security. If you can find that in my personal blog at Dave K dot substack dot com. So now let me switch to open platforms. And here I'm referring to the availability of interfaces that enable a vibrant ecosystem of innovators to build on top of those, inter of the, those interfaces. An important example to talk about today here is the is end-to-end -end encrypted messaging services. So we have plenty of open standards and, and open source software in this space. We have things like Signal, Wire, Matrix. And in fact, uh, they offer end-to-end -end encrypted experiences that most experts believe offer superior privacy to a closed platform like iMessage. However, while some end-to-end -end encrypted services may use open source and open standards, doesn't mean that they necessarily are open platforms that allow third-party messaging applications to interoperate. So as we look at regulations that demand interoperability with end, -end encrypted services, open platforms will make this reality much better and faster. So when you send a message from iMessage to someone who doesn't use iMessage, unfortunately, your messages are no longer end, -end encrypted at all. Now with end-to-end -end encrypted interoperability, we'll see that the service providers embracing open platforms will finally give consumers what they deserve, which is a private experience, regardless of which app they are using and, and that their friends and, and family might be using. Now finally, let's switch gears to open information sharing and transparency. So open source, open platforms, these can improve safety outcomes for consumers and businesses, but there's still much more that goes into delivering a safe product and service. For example, if I'm in the market for a webcam, I wanna know how long each product will continue to get security updates. I wanna know the sensors that are built into the product and how many, like what kind of sensitive data might be collected from the device and how that data may be used uh, or even shared with third parties. I wanna know that the product is using standardized encryption protocols for storing my video data and for transmitting it to the cloud. I wanna know whether access to the video data can be protected with MFA or even better, as you've heard multiple times today, with phishing resistant MFA. But today there's no way for consumer to understand these safety ingredients in digital products. And since there's no open information sharing and transparency there, as a consumer, we can't make better decisions to protect ourselves. And in fact, these differences in quality can't be a purchase driver at all. And since consumers aren't making purchasing decisions based on the security and privacy ingredients, uh, most product developers don't have a strong incentive to improve those ingredients. This leads to the cycle of underinvestment and poor outcomes that we've seen in the past three plus decades of the World Wide Web. The good news is that if we can drive transparency in those ingredients, that cycle becomes a virtuous one where consumers understand the relative safety quality across products. They can make better decisions to protect themselves. And consumer demand for better safety will drive developers to compete on those ingredients rather than only on the speeds and feeds and the bells and whistles. So at Google, we have a long tradition and culture around transparency from 
publishing blogs and papers that describe how things work, to the public bulletins and rewards programs for vulnerabilities, to the transparency reports that show ecosystem metrics around safety, and of course, publishing those ingredients labels I just mentioned for our own products in the form of uh, commitments that we publish on our websites that, that explain security support lifetime commitments, for example. Also in the form of safety labels for mobile apps that show whether they meet security best practices, as well as they explain what data is collected and how data is used. So users can understand and make better decisions. Now these labels are not just in our own apps, but we built that into platforms because of course we believe in open platforms. So we built it into the Google Play mobile app platform and users can understand data is collected from the apps and how that data is used and shared. And that, 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 that label is shown directly to users who can see that when they're considering apps for download. Now, while these app labels are relatively new, uh, we've already enforced on over 10,000 apps for not properly declaring their data usage. Um, and apps representing billions of downloads have been modified by the developers to reduce collection and sharing. So this is just really a great example of how open information sharing and transparency drives better developer behavior and better outcomes for users. Now, we're also working closely with governments across the world, including in the UK, Singapore, United States, on digital labeling regulations that encourage adoption of these ingredients labels for connected consumer products. And we're working with the Connectivity Standards Alliance to build a transparency program that enables manufacturers to certify their products against these open standards for measuring security and privacy quality. And then those national label programs can then refer to these, to these monitoring regimes. So what I've just described is basically a formula for how open systems can make our digital world much safer than it is today, and to also help us get ahead of emerging safety risks. The formula is we, we define the best practices for safety requirements in an open standard. We build those standards into open platforms so they can scale much more efficiently. And then we drive demand for improved safety and privacy ingredients for connected products. But the same formula can be used to improve lots of things. We can improve, we can improve content moderation in, in uh, social media and other public content platforms. And we can ensure the responsible deployment of generative AI technologies, which of course is uh, top of mind right now. So I hope that these words uh, can inspire you to help the world be safer by collaborating and participating in the power of open systems. I hope the conference has been going well for you and that uh, you'll join us for the Google reception and the happy hour that's, that's starting right after this. You can walk over to the atrium for that. Thanks for all you do to help protect the digital world and please feel free to reach out to me directly if I can ever be of assistance to you on this journey together. Thank you. Thank you again so much for the commentary as well as the support from Google. It means a lot to the community. We appreciate it, sir. Thanks, everyone. So they can't actually put the drinks out until exactly 4 o'clock. However, you are welcome to go refresh. Continue that networking thing that you have been uh, entreated to do. And at 1600, 4 PM, we will have drinks available for a formal happy hour. <laughs>